the topic for this section is characteristics of the religions. The last session we talked about different approaches to the religions, and now we look at characteristics of the religions. We can look at the religions in several different ways as we look at their characteristics. First, we can look at them in terms of size of the people that are included within the religious system. Some are tribal. Some are national. And some are universal. The Zanaki, among whom I grew up in Tanzania, their religion was tribal. It was the religion of the Zanaki people. No Zanaki ever considered becoming a missionary to go to the nearby Jita culture and encourage the Jita to become Zanaki. Never. Their religion and practices was for the Zanaki people. Now, there were some similarities between the Zanaki religion and the religions of other tribes around the Zanaki people, but none of the tribes around them had any thought of missionary work. Their faith systems were the faith systems of their particular tribe. That's one way to look at religions, one characteristic of religions, to be a faith system for a particular tribe and a particular people, only that. Another way to look at the religions is to look at them as national systems for the nation, which may include different societies, not just one society, but the religion of a national system. Can you think of some national religions that are national systems only, that don't seek to recruit other people into their system? Can you think of some? Let me share a few thoughts. I would say that classical Hinduism is a national system. And one of the political challenges that modern day India experiences is just that. That Hindu orthodoxy would like to see India become a Hindu state, in which case all of the communities like the Jains or the uh, Christians or the Muslims would fit into this Hindu state as expressions of Muslim caste or Christian caste. Neither the Muslims nor the Christians want that. And the Constitution of, in, of, uh, of India declares India to be a secular state. It's not a Hindu state, constitutionally speaking. Uh, I often visit Indonesia. It's predominantly a Muslim society there, but it's a secular state. It's not a Muslim state, constitutionally. It's a pluralist secular state. And so. You can have a, a, a national system in which the dominant religion is a particular religion like, like, uh, like India, uh, and, and yet the nation constitutionally is not considered to be a Hindu state. But Hinduism, in its impulses, in its, uh, uh, in its modern day push, uh, the Orthodox Hindu party would like to see, uh, in, it would like to see uh, India become a, uh, a Hindu state. So that would be one example, I think. I think Confucianism in China is an example of a national uh, religious system. You don't find, rarely, do you find any Chinese anywhere in the world encouraging people to become Confucianists. Uh, some places, once in a while you have that happening, but it's most unusual. Confucianism is a religious political system of ancient China. It's not a missionary movement seeking to incorporate other peoples into the system. Um, a classic example of a national system would be Shintoism. 
and I hope later in this class to have a bit of time to, to talk about Shintoism, wherein the emperor uh, for a number of generations was considered to be divine, the descendant of the sun god. And so not only was the emperor considered to be divine, but the Japanese people and islands were considered to be divine, having come from the sun god. And so that nationalism tended to push uh, Japanese uh, society in the directions that led to World War II, where they were extending their national identity to other nations. But they did it as a nation. They weren't encouraging people to convert to Shintoism. No, they didn't do that. But uh, their notion that they were a divine people and a divine nation and a divine uh, islands uh, helped to encourage that kind of uh, expansionism that took place in World War II, where Japanese armies crossed vast areas of Asia and the Pacific Ocean area. So one way to look at religions is national systems. National systems. Tribal systems and national systems. And neither national systems nor tribal systems are missionary systems. A third way to look at religions is uh, universal. Universal faiths. Universal faiths that believe they have a mission to the whole world. What would be an example of these universal faiths? Well, one that comes to my mind right away is Buddhism. The Buddhist monks who followed Buddha believed they had a good news message um, of psychological disciplines that would help a person uh, escape from suffering. And so right from the beginning, Buddhism had a missionary impulse where it was sending monks here and there throughout Asia to give this teaching of Buddha, which would help a person escape suffering. It was the kind of compassionate commitment to helping people escape suffering. And so Buddhism perceived that it has a universal mission to the whole world. Buddhism. What else? What else would be an example of a universal movement? Christian. And right away we think of the Christian faith, exactly right. And next to the Christian faith, we of course think of Islam. Both Islam and the Christian faith are, are uh, universal movements who believe both that they have a universal faith to communicate to the whole world. Now, where does that notion come from? Well, the very beginnings of that conviction of a universal mission goes right back to Genesis chapter 12. I'd like to read it for you. Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, go to your country your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Amazing. Now in the ancient world where Abraham lived, back there uh, 3,000 years ago, why uh, the gods that people followed gave power to their followers to exploit people, to tramp on them, to dominate them. And so you had these different tribal deities or national deities that are fighting against one another and and the, uh, the gods themselves fought, fought against one another. And the god who succeeded in defeating his enemy god would be the god who would bless those who were, who were uh, uh, following the enemy god. And so the gods themselves uh, blessed those who followed them, but empowered people to exploit others. But here, all of this is turned upside down. Abraham and his descendants are to be a blessing to all nations. A blessing to all nations. So when I talk with Muslims, they talk about this. How that they believe that Muhammad was, was appointed by God to carry forward this 
mission of Abraham to be a blessing to all peoples. You see, that Islam is to be, is to follow Abraham's example in becoming an imam over the nations, bringing the instruction of God to the nations, to all nations. That's their conviction, you see. And that's the Christian conviction, that the Christian church is called to be a blessing to all nations. Uh, that Abraham's promise, God's promise to Abraham of blessing to all nations is a calling that the church should take seriously. And wherever the church goes, it should be a people of blessing, blessing the nations, you see. And so when we look at world religions, we think of the Abrahamic faiths, meaning Islam and Christianity and Judaism, although Judaism has lost much of its sense of mission to the nations, much more concerned about preserving its life and vitality, um, although there is some of that within Judaism even today of being a light to the nations. But preeminently, it is Islam and the church that feels conviction about carrying forward this call to be a blessing to the nations. And so we refer to these faiths as the Abrahamic faiths, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And half of the world's population are Abrahamic. It's amazing. Of the six plus, what, two billion, whatever, uh, six uh, billion, 200 million people on earth, that half of them consider themselves to be the spiritual heirs of the faith of Abraham with a mission to the whole world to uh, bless the nations, to bless the nations. These are called the Abrahamic faiths. It's amazing. So half the world would would trace its spiritual origins back to this passage I just read a few minutes ago. And they're not supposed to bless the nations by dominating the nations, by oppressing the nations, by oppressing the tribes, but rather by blessing them, empowering them, uh, uh, encouraging them, that they are to be encouragers to all peoples on earth as a people of blessing, people encouraging, righteous living and, and uh, and uh, living faithfully to God. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so we can think of world, uh, world religion, we can think of two major systems, you know, the Abrahamic systems, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and the non-Abrahamic systems, which would be systems like Buddhism or Hinduism and Shintoism and so forth and so forth. They're not part of the Abrahamic family. <coughs> So that's one way of looking at faith. And I must say, when I go to a Jewish synagogue or when I go to, or when I go to a Muslim mosque, I feel very differently about that than when I go to a Hindu temple. I feel very differently. It's a very, very different uh, faith system that the Abrahamic faiths embrace uh, and, uh, and that of other, other religious systems. It's, um, it's very different. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. So what is preeminently different? Well, preeminently the difference is that the Abrahamic faiths believe that God created the heavens and the earth and that he calls people into a covenant relationship with him. That's Abrahamic faiths, you know. Um, that's, 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 that's not Hindu faith. Uh, they, they, they don't believe that there is God, the transcendent creator, who calls us to live in a, in a covenant relationship with him. So the faith understandings of uh, the non-Abrahamic faiths is very different than that of the Abrahamic faiths. Another way to think of religions is those that have scripture and those that don't have scriptures. The Zanaki, among whom I lived in Tanzania, they did not have scripture. They had no scripture. In fact, it was an illiterate society. They had no writing. 
uh, but then you go down to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and here are the Muslim communities, and they have scripture, the Quran, and other scriptures as well, other writings, holy writings that they rely upon. Same is true of the church, you know. When you go to India, which is a very literate society, you find hundreds and hundreds of Hindu scriptures that have been written down through the centuries. And we go and meet uh, the, uh, the Japanese Shintoists. Again, they have scriptures. So a lot of religious systems have scriptures, and many don't, particularly the tribal systems do not have scriptures. So this is one way in which one can think of religion, so, so they have scriptures and those that don't have scriptures.